You know, if there's one question I get asked more than any other, more even than if you don't know me by now, will you ever, ever know me at all? That question would have to be, Mark, what are your first impressions of the Nikon F75 with its standard 28 to 80 kit zoom lens? Well, today we're going to try and answer that question. So I neglected to mention that today I'm packing some Ilford Delta 100. Film that's six months out of date, but hopefully should still behave fairly normally if I develop it for just a normal time. Maybe I'll actually develop it as if I was shooting at 80 or something like that, just to give it a bit more of a chance. Delta is known as a good sharp film. It's not one I have a lot of experience with. I've used quite a bit of Delta 400. Um, with mixed results on the whole, it's proven to be a pretty good film, but Delta 400 always struggles with the fixer that I use. I just use Ilford Hypam or Ilford Rapid Fixer, I think it is. And it uh, takes a little bit longer than the normal five minutes fix time. So uh, I find with Delta that I need to give it eight. And that usually, um, helps otherwise you end up with slightly foggy negatives um, or milky is probably a better description for them so Ilford Delta 100 six months old might not be brilliant but then again I don't have a brilliant camera either All right, this is a 15th of a second at f3.8, I think. 20th of a second, not so good, I don't think, that one. So here we have a couple of tree trunks, all truncated, literally at least with the end sawn off. I wonder if I can fit them in the frame and get the cloud in there too. Shall we see? I wanna go vertical. Not convinced that's any good, but hey, we're here just testing a camera, our first impressions of the Nikon F75 with its 28 to 80 millimeter crippled kit lens. And my God, this was a dirty piece of kit when I first got it. Yeah, so I purchased this camera secondhand from cash converters, cashies as we like to call them in Australia. And uh, it came and it was pretty gunky, pretty manky, needed a bit of a clean, as you can see. Now, seems to be okay. The only thing that I'm a bit worried about was that I put fresh batteries in it yesterday, came to the camera this morning and it looked like the batteries are dead. So whether there is an electrical fault or if by turning the camera on and leaving it on accidentally, it's draining the light meter, who knows? We shall see. This is all part of the fun of buying these cheap cameras. Thank you, I feel welcome. And I'm here. So this is a Quenda habitat area. Okay, I've never seen them actually out live. They tend to be out at night, but they never tell me when. Tell me, tell me, tell me when, Quenda, 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 Quenda. You're gonna be out next time and maybe I'll try and do some wildlife photography with you. Come on, there has to be something here. A little bit into the sun. A little bit wide, maybe. No interruptions. Let's see if we can do that. Maybe focus on the branch of the tree. 
the line's going through at 90th of a second f4.8 to get a little bit further back perhaps oh that keeps me in the shade too which is probably good for the lens stops the flare and the dog got you tell me tell me tell me when quenda 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 boring 125th at f5.6 Let us follow the path to the Swan Alcoa Land Care Program because we know that there's nothing that aluminium mining companies love more than caring for the land. Ninetieth of a second, f5.6, and really it's just straight on. Ooh, bit of flare there. What I'm gonna do is, you can't see it, but I'm gonna cover that. All right, this thing definitely needs a lens hood. All right, 90th f5.6. And it even went up to 125th f5.6 when I didn't have the lens covered. You know what, I'm gonna take another one without the lens covered so that you can see the effects of the flare. There we go. So this is the Lake Claremont wetland. Not much wet going on right now. Okay, a very basic landscape shot. This one. 28 mils, 28 millimeters, 250th of a second F8. God, it doesn't get more classic than that, does it really? Well, I won't be parking my car here, but what's kind of cool is that they do have a little lost and found basket. And one of the things that I do like to do is take photos of found objects. It's kind of great because someone's collected them all for me. All right, let's try and capture this. There's no way this is gonna be artistic. 90th F 4.8, maybe look in a little bit. quite liberating having a new camera out of date film wanting to just do a test and shoot off frames fairly quickly you just go out and you shoot I'm not here to make art I'm here to walk the dog of a second I think it was a bad effort so we might cut short this brief morning walk It's 30.4 degrees already and we're heading for 33 which isn't too hot but um, it's up there already I think it might get a little bit higher than that so let's truncate this little walk and let my dog get a bit of cool and a bit of water just looks like a slice of Australia to me. God, more corrugated roofs everywhere. This is far too good. I'm having much too good a time here. A little slice of sky sandwiched between the corrugations and variegations. Now that's an interesting house. I wonder if I can get closer to it while still maintaining some height. So I can crush that perspective. 
nothing special, but I just like the architecture. 350th F9.5. Ah, look. It's good to know that the domestic staff have somewhere to live. And care for our wildlife. I suspect they're not great drivers. I'll keep an eye out when I'm driving home. Should we see if we can capture that care for our wildlife without getting myself killed? Hey, I'm a quenda crossing the road. Bit big for a quenda. All right, now I can go home. Well, what can I say? Like myself, this camera has seen better days. All of that millennial photographic optimism crushed by the insurgency of digital and hindered, let's face it, by its flimsy build quality. I have a fondness for Nikon SLRs, the consumer ones, or is it simply Stockholm Syndrome? Some weird psychological bond created between crappy old cameras and a crappy old photographer with his crappy old photographs. I'll hang off on the self-flagellation though, or at the very least direct it towards this Nikon F75. I don't know if the last person to own this used it as toilet paper, or it was given to their three-year-old as a toy to play with before it ended up on the second-hand shelf among the fallen aspirations of exercise bicycles and DVD copies of Daddy Day Camp. But suffice it to say, this camera it's pretty rough, and I don't want to be unfair, because I'm sure in its prime this was a titan. But this camera went down the Mickey Rourke path of self-improvement, and has been beaten harder than a red-headed stepchild. So, let's get the worst out of the way. The batteries seem to be draining suspiciously quickly, and the zoom ring turns as smoothly as a skier on asphalt. Shame, because I see promise here. I have the hideously ugly F50 and the perilously flimsy F55. Both of these have had their spot in the sun on this channel, and it's fair to say that while the F50 and F55 are both crippled clones of what we would expect from a real Nikon camera, the F50 at least has a reassuring heft to it, and the F55 distinguishes itself by being the smallest and lightest camera that I actually own. I also regularly use the F65, which sits somewhere between the 55 and this camera, but I think the thing about the F75 is it is supposed to be a notch up, offering more segments to the matrix exposure metering, spot metering, and that's about it. The F55 doesn't work with newer lenses that have the focus motor built in, but none of these work properly with manual lenses anyway. Look, it's all too complicated for a short video about first impressions of an op shop find, but it builds incrementally on the 55 and the 65, and it supports TTL for external flashes, and is the first cheap consumer camera to support stabilization in VR lenses. It still suffers from a low flash sync speed of a 90th of a second and you can't adjust the ISO manually, which limits its value for outdoor flash photography and for those of us that bulk load. But really, you have to climb the greasy pole of photographic power to cameras like the F80 and the F100 to get some of those supposedly professional features. Look, I've got far too many of these cameras. Sure, at some point I'll review all of them so I can create my own comparison within the pantheon of subpar Nikon cameras, but for now, let's just consider it on its own merits. First things first, it works. And as for the quality, well, I didn't really tax the camera too much. I stuck it on program mode, looked through the viewfinder, checked it was in focus and the shutter speed wasn't too low and pressed the button. In that sense, it was a lot of fun being able to take random shots without thinking too much. As for this lens, well, it's sharp enough, perhaps a little smeary in the very corners, though in open areas I really didn't have to open up the lens, so you're probably seeing it at its best. Honestly, it behaves very much like the G version of the lens that came with the Nikon F55, but with an aperture ring, so a bit more versatile for those cameras that can use it. Once you get out of the focal zone, though, things start to get a bit frazzled. The bokeh has what could best be described as character, if that character is Cartman from South Park. Oh man, that's not cool. Either you'll find it mildly amusing or extremely offensive based upon your own subjective tastes. I don't actually mind it here. Honestly, the subject is so boring, I'm glad the background bludgeons you with busyness. 
Arguably, photography shouldn't be a case of spot the subject, though most of that, I think, is really down to my own composition skills. In that sense, slow maximum aperture isn't going to afford you all of the focus separation you want, and the limited zoom range of 28 to 80 is adequate without getting you close enough to the snow leopards that inhabit these territories, or ferret out a quenda, for that matter. Let's not forget, though, that 28 was wide back in the day when lots of lenses were still maxing out at 35mm. 28 to 80 is still better than 35 to 70. Distortions seem better than many of my lenses, even more expensive ones, but you're not going to really get a good sense of chromatic aberration on black and white film, so I'll reserve judgment on that particular lens category. Speaking of the film, the Delta 100 was souped in 510 pyro, which is kinda new to me. I'm down to my last 300 milliliters of Extol stock without much likelihood of being able to replace it in the foreseeable future, so I bought this tiny little bottle of what looks like treacle as a stopgap. Pyro lasts forever, and it's now joined Rodnell as my backup option while I hunt for a new economical and ecological alternative. Let me know in the comments what your favourite black and white film developer is, because I'm on the hunt for something cheap that I can buy here in Australia. And it's not to say that Pyro isn't a good developer from what I've seen. It's just a bit weird. Its syrupy consistency makes it a bit difficult to mix and the negative just looked different to me. For those that aren't aware, 510 Pyro is a fairly recent formulation of a range of developers that use Pyrogalol, which has staining properties and gives a unique sharp low grain result that's supposed to help manage things like contrast in processing and printing. Well, I haven't quite made up my mind yet. Since I don't use Delta 100 much either, it's hard to form an objective opinion. What I did notice though, was that the results were very low grain. Initially, I wasn't convinced that it was sharp and I tend to scan my negatives in as very flat anyway, but what was noticeable was just how well the scans held up to adding contrast and sharpness later. You can definitely get a sense of the staining. In that sense, it looks a bit like a black and white version of color film. And I was careful not to use stop bath in the process because apparently the stain gets leached away by the acetic acid. So I think I like it. I did underdevelop it a bit, not deliberately, just because I'm extremely sloppy and forgot to check the temperature before I put the developer in. So I just based my developing time on the temperature on the leftover distilled water sitting on the floor. In any case, the truth was there in black and white, or at least part of the truth, since I'd only shot half the roll. The next day was cooler, so I hit the same spot. Let's see that truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and then pick some favorite babies from these photographic fetuses. Another day, slightly different conditions, a little bit more grain, a little bit more cool today, quite pleasant. But the day did begin with some disappointment. Woke up to find my camera, the batteries were dead. Fresh yesterday, dead today, the camera was turned off. There's a problem with this camera. Still, we'll see what we can get out of it. One of the things I have done is change the lens to a Tamron 28 to 200 millimeter, thinking, well, if there's anything that could go wrong, say, for example, the lens or the camera, how would I know if it was the lens? How would I know if it was the camera? This lens works. We'll see if this camera does. Oh my God, there is an opportunity for a lonely tree. I love a lonely tree, particularly when it's against the beautiful lush waters of an Australian lake in summer.
And I wonder if there's something here. It's all so messy. People talk about woodland photography and how difficult it is. Yep. Now, I think compositionally this might be a bit ugly, but I do like the light, so we can see if we can get maybe a vertical picture out of this one. We can see anyway. 90th of a second at f4.8. It's all rather pretty and messy and unphotogenic. These really are just snaps. There's nothing really to merit these photographs other than the quite pleasant light and the shape of the tree branches. There you go. I might really start taking pictures of empty roads just to test film, I guess I am. Perhaps a bit of twisty vine around a fence. Am I really going to stoop to take a photograph of leaves? It's not even the taking the photograph of leaves that's the problem, it's trying to take a good photograph of leaves. All right, trying to go for paler leaves against a darker background. Yeah, we'll see. Thirtieth of a second f three point eight at the wide end. Okay, ended up getting it at a forty fifth of a second. What about this flower? All right, we found an exit. Let's try this. See where it takes us. You know, as a colour photograph, I quite like that. But nothing in black and white, I think. Is that Prince? Three shots. How am I going to take three shots here? Are there three shots to be had? It's true, I retreated back to the comforting shadows and cold geometry of the man-made world to finish off the roll. So let's talk about the camera first. Should I send it back? I mean, it works, 
kind of, it's not like I can't just put batteries in the camera when I take it out and remove them when I'm done. If I need something to last me all day, it's not like I'm short of alternatives. And while ratcheting that zoom back to 28 millimeters is a grind, literally, it does get there and the lens seems to operate well otherwise. For the price I paid, I'll probably hang on to it at least until I can do a proper review and maybe find its rightful place in the pantheon of Nikon scuzzier film SLRs. I can't honestly complain about the photos either. I can't say it was the most inspiring session, but hopefully you clipped on this video to experience a real world role rather than a curated collection anyway. But still, there were some photos that I liked more than others. I think as ugly as the out of focus areas could be, they could also be quite interesting. So if I had to pick six favorites, it would be this one because I like the curve of the tree and of course it has my dog in it, or at least my dog's ass. This one because for once I managed to capture Oscar's portrait, even if based on the look of his muzzle, he'd clearly been licking said ass. I can't pass up a lonely tree obviously and pick this one because it had the least distractions and you get a bit of a sense of the dried out lake bed. I'll probably come back to it at some point and try to do the subject matter some justice. As for this one, look, I really don't know what I was doing when I took this one. I can't find anywhere for my eye to just rest comfortably on it, but maybe that's the point of this image. The lack of a single focus point makes you just look at the patterns in the branches and the light was bright, but not so harsh. So you get a sense of sharpness and texture in the bark. God bless Prince. From musical icon to pine-scented Prince Pori car deodorant, he remains a star among a constellation of dappled sunlight on the windscreen. And this final one, because a makeshift fence is much more flattering to a subject than nature, and provides a beautiful square pattern to show off the frenetic out-of-focus areas of the 28-80. to 80. So there you go. Six diamonds in the rough, or at the very least, half a dozen sequins hoovered up from the sticky carpet of life by my Nikon N75, or F75. God, they just come up with so many different names. A camera that, like myself, though, performs as well as can be expected under the circumstances and can at least get the job done. Later.